Brett Dickinson here with 1999 Oakland Raiders Courage Award recipient. And I see the helmet hanging around in the background. Uh, it looks very beautiful. It's still the test of time. I appreciate that it's it's on display with all the other amazing things you got hanging out behind you. I see some good stuff, uh, especially as an Eagles fan. I see, I see a couple of those white jerseys that look pretty nice in the background as well. But Eric yeah. Allen, is a Hall of Fame semifinalist once again. But thank yep. you for joining us today and uh, appreciate uh, you taking some time to talk with us. Oh, no problem. Uh, just uh, good to be here and, and spend some time in the best part of the year. You have uh, the holidays coming up and, of course, uh, uh, the middle of football season. So we're excited about uh, both our birds and, uh, for now, our Raiders. Yeah, very, uh, <clears throat> very emotional uh, for me. Uh, you think about 1998, uh, I was um, traded to the Raiders, and it, it was kind of a whirlwind how that happened. Actually, if I can give you just a little brief detail. Um, so I had a season in New Orleans and didn't go very well, and I was just ready to move on. I wanted to have my later years uh, really in, in situations where I was having the opportunity to play in the playoffs and hopefully get to the Super Bowl. And uh, that's the ultimate goal. Things didn't work out uh, too well that last year in New Orleans. And I said, hey, you know what? I need to go. I want to get traded. And uh, fortunately for me, there were some teams that called. But I took a trip to Oakland on my way to San Francisco because that was my main destination. I wanted to go to San Francisco 49ers. But I knew the defensive coordinator was a great friend of mine and who recruited me out of high school named Willie Shaw. He was a defensive coordinator. Uh, at Oakland at the time. They were just changing coaches, going through a lot of things. The move from Los Angeles to Oakland was maybe two years, but they were going to finally start playing in Oakland and practicing in Oakland. I go for a short visit just to say hi to Coach Shaw. I had no meaning of playing with the Raiders. Uh, getting to the building uh, in Oakland, I'm talking to this younger guy, you know, kind of short, uh, blonde hair. We're just kind of talking back and forth. Uh, he's talking to me about Philadelphia. I'm like, why is this guy, you know, talking about Philadelphia? I'm here in Oakland. So finish talking with him, go speak with Willie, speak with uh, the late, great uh, Al Davis, who's, you know, just uh, a legend in the game. Then I go and talk to the head coach. Well, the head coach is John Gruden, the guy I spoke, <laughs> first spoke with, who didn't look, you know, as old as I was at the time. And remember, I'm going into year 10. Um, so I'm talking to Gruden and I'm like, I didn't know you were the head coach. He's like, yeah. Uh, so I talk to him, I fly home and ready to go to San Francisco. I get a call back from a friend of mine who was on my team in New Orleans who had been released. Um, he said, guess where I am? I said, where are you? He says, I'm in Oakland. I said, what are you doing in Oakland? Gruton had signed him because he knew me and him were friends. That was all I needed to hear. I signed up with Oakland. I'm playing that first year in 98. We're great. We're, I think, five and two. Um, we're headed to the playoffs. I have five interceptions. We're playing the uh, Seattle Seahawks. I'm covering Joey Galloway, 4-240. They try a deep ball on me. I pick it off. I'm about to take it to the house. I go to plant. I tear my ACL. Week like eight or nine, year 10, an ACL. So I had no idea it was a torn ACL. I'd never been injured like that. I'm on the sideline saying, just get me a leg sleeve and get me back in the game. <laughs> That's how oblivious I was to the injury. The doc was saying, no, you're going to be out a little while. I'm like, how long? You know, player two, he's like, I think you tore your ACL. Didn't have any idea kind of what it was. So fast forward, you go through that whole year. That was November. I tore my ACL. The next year, and as I'm going through the process, everyone's saying, man, you're 10. It was a great career. I said, well, I'm going to totally rehab this thing and make my decision on the field, hopefully in training camp. So I crunch, crunch it. I go through this process. I get back. I get on the field in the summer, July, August. I start in September. I play probably half the season until I feel right, but I play. You know, I was six or seven months out, and I'm playing on ACL. And so at the end of the season, when my players in the locker room uh, voted for me, it was about that whole year and a half that it took for me to get back to being able to line up 
play against NFL receivers, make plays, and have that leadership about here's how you overcome adversity. It's not about the talk. It's about the action. It's about the work you put in. Everything that I thought that my career was about, that six or seven months really tested it. You know, are you really confident in yourself? The workouts, the, all the training that you've done when no one can see, was that worth it? And it ended up being worth it. And I just really appreciate, you know, all my team members, you know, voting me. Uh, but when you get there, it's really not about your sacrifices. It's really not about um, the adversity that affected you. It's an opportunity for you to shed light on those folks who were responsible, really, for me getting there, whether it's my wife, whether it's my, you know, my brother who I grew up with, who had all his confidence. So it's an opportunity, a chance, just like I hope the Hall of Fame will be this year to shed light on all those folks who have never had that spotlight and have never um, had the opportunity to pick a ball off and take it to the house, you know, in Oakland or in Philadelphia. So um, both those examples were times where, yes, the focus was on me and I got the award and I was standing on stage and I was excited, but it's always a time to shed light on those folks who helped you get there. Yeah, I think, first of all, when you start looking at the Hall of Fame, as the, your career continues to kind of progress and you start obviously looking at numbers and, you know, there's specific numbers that, you know, as a player, a cornerback, you're trying to hit. And it was always that 50 number. Right. So uh, that was one of the things as the as your career continues to to go on, hopefully in a positive way. One, you're concerned about winning. And uh, two, you're concerned about the legacy you leave behind. You always want to kind of leave whatever situation you were in a little bit better. And that was always my method from day one, stepping on the football field uh, in Philadelphia and many camps or rookie camps, you know, that 1988 season. Uh, so that's always been my mode to kind of left the place a little better than you found it. Just had great people around me. But as your career starts to, to project and go forward and you see yourself, you know, amongst the top players in the national football league, you do start to think about those things. So um, that, that number was always kind of in my head, you know, if you get 50, you're going to be good. You're going to be good. And fortunately for me, after, you know, my last year uh, in Oakland, I hopped right into ESPN. So I was always busy, always around. And I didn't really have the time to play, you know, it, you know, it's politics. You got to yeah. play the game a little bit, you know. And so I was always kind of running and, and just excited to to be in my next stage of my life at ESPN, something that I wanted to do for such a long time. So I didn't really play the game as much. And and as the voting started to kind of come up, you know, you started to make sure that people understood your story. People understood, you know, where you sat with the guys, you know, who were being voted in. And, you know, 20 something years later, I'm still a little bit out. So I uh, made a little put the last couple of years. And, and obviously, I definitely think y'all should be, on, be in with some of the players who have uh, gone in, the cornerbacks who have gone in lately with the same or similar type numbers than me. So I think this is going to be year. I trust this is going to be the year with a lot of folks like you and, and, uh, and, and the rest kind of helping me out with, with, uh, with my journey. You know, I, I really thought that, that was one of those secure <laughs> type records where, you know, nothing's ever secure, but it was brought to my attention early a couple of weeks ago when he tied the record, just a lot of buzz. And so let me look at this young man and see, you know, kind of what he's about and uh, really great story uh, from him. Uh, I, I think one of the other starting corners was hurt early in the year. So he had his opportunity and that's really what it's all about. Getting that chance, getting that opportunity and showing what you have. Funny story is my family celebrating Thanksgiving and we have a you know bunch of a uh, bunch of family members and we're sitting down and you know just kind of have the game on television. We're eating a little dessert here and there, and guess who breaks on an out route, uh, Mr. Bland, and takes it to the house. And so my name pops up again, and then all the the younger uh, uh, family members hopped on social media and it's like, hey, you know. You know, he's tied my uncle or he's broken my uncle's record, but, you know, he's not as good as my uncle. So just a, 
a lot of great buzz, but congratulations to that young man. It takes a lot. It takes timing. It takes the ability to kind of understand what's going on. And that kid, he does a great job in breaking on those routes. Although he had a tough day on Thursday night, you know, one of those <laughs> days when you're a corner, you're going to be tested and you have to find ways to make plays. Yeah. Well, first is, is my older brother. He was eight years older than me. So he had seen and been through the hurdles uh, that I was going to have to go through. And although he didn't remove them all, I was a little more advanced than the people who were my age, you know, and started at a really early age. I'm talking about eight years old, you know, and in the backyard throwing the football, just uh, sitting down watching football. And that was the first part of it. I really enjoyed that part of watching the game and then finding a player who I would love to be like. And it first started, you know, with Cliff Branch. And Cliff Branch was my guy, a little undersized, but had a specific skill set that separated him from everybody else in the football field. So I always played with uh, a little older, you know, group of guys. Uh, I was always the young one. So to stay on the street to play, you had to make that catch. And if you ran into the cars, you know, fell in the grass or fell in some shrubs, you couldn't complain because they, the big guys were not going to allow you to play. So that was big to grow up on 42nd and Ocean View here in San Diego. You know, plenty of great uh, mentors athletically. Uh, but more importantly, my brother just made sure that the school setting was important. And that's something that, you know, when you're 12, 13 years old, you really don't have an idea of, of what it takes to be successful, you know, academically. And uh, funny story, I started up at a junior high school uh, and just wasn't going well, you know, and just doing some knucklehead stuff, right? And uh, like, like we all do, right? <laughs> like we all do. And I, when I was suspended uh, from school and my brother was like, listen, you're not going back into that environment, you know? And that was like the first couple of years in California of busing. He says, there's a bus that keeps stopping near our house. We're going to follow that bus basically out to wherever it goes and wherever it goes, that's where you're going to go to school. So that bus, you know, went on a couple freeways and ended up in uh, Quinn Loma High School and Dana Junior High before that. So that was like the first really um, situation that he kind of like, you know, put a stop sign down and said, hey, you know, you're not going in this direction. This direction going to go. And that move really transformed my life because now I'm in an environment with multiple people that are um, uh, families, college graduates, you know, the process after high school is not, you know, playing professional baseball like I wanted to do. It was going to college, getting a college education. Uh, and so that's the first time we, um, that environment changes for me. Uh, and so after that, Willie Shaw, of course, recruited me. Um, I was a baseball player in high school also. And, and Arizona State was where I wanted to go because, you know, Reggie Jackson played baseball there. And uh, I thought I was going to be a baseball player. You know what? I get there and Barry Bonds is there. Mike Kelly, who's I played for the Atlanta Braves. Mike Devereaux, another, you know, second player in the draft. They were just loaded, right? So I was going to try and walk on to baseball. <laughs> you know, that was a no-go. Uh, so I get to college and I'm surrounded by just a great uh, group of, guys in college. David Fulcher, who played for the Cincinnati Bengals at the time, was kind of like a mentor, two-time All-American. I remember him coming back to college, letting us all know that we could play in the league. There were guys on his team that we were better than. In college, really was the first time that I thought that maybe it's a possibility. My deal was I wanted to go to Arizona State, hopefully win a Rose Bowl, and then work for ESPN. That, that's what I wanted to do. I went to uh, Arizona State, the School of Journalism, uh, Walter Cronkite. So I wanted to work for ESPN. I never really thought that realistically I would play football in the National Football League. And uh, so when David Fulcher came back and kind of gave us that, those, you know, little details and insight into what it was like, I think he really helped a lot of us. Anthony Parker played 14 years in the league. Uh, myself, uh, 
We had uh, 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 Scott Stevens, who played for the Green Bay Packers. So that offseason, we really prepared ourselves and worked as if we were going to get a shot. And that was going into uh, the junior, senior year. And uh, so once you once you start to understand and realize that you can possibly play with all these great players that you've watched on television, it kind of changes your preparation. It changes your mindset a little bit. And so now you start to kind of lean on those guys who are there in the league. So Willie Shaw was a huge, huge uh, piece of that. I would talk to him and call him after games. Uh, and remember, this is not cell phone. This is landline. At least I was push button. Push button. Push, push, push button, button at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so Willie Shaw um, was really a, a, a person who had my back and understood that the way I went about playing football uh, was the right way. So he taught me how to prepare, how to study, how to watch film. And I was onto that really early. Uh, so when I got my feet on the ground in Philadelphia, I was ready to roll. I mean, from a, from a mental standpoint, and it goes back to playing with older guys when I was younger. And so I hopped right in the saddle, Roy Nell Young, who was a fantastic cornerback at the time in Philadelphia had played in the Super Bowl against the Raiders uh like i think 1980 80, maybe or yeah, 83 yeah. right right 80, uh, 81 or 80 81 right yeah 80 81 so at that time i was a huge raider fan and eagle fan because the eagles had a punt returner who was from san diego gotcha. so i'm watching cliff branch my guy eat up my new guy in Ronell williams you know <laughs> right now so it but Roynell was the kind of player who every Friday would take all the young DBs, take them down to Broad Street, take them down to Philadelphia, introduce them to uh, Boyd's, uh, the great yep. Uh, yep. apartment store there. We would walk around the community. He would just talk to us and tell us, you know, this is what I've done. I've been here eight years. This is how to be a pro. Don't make the same mistakes I did my first couple of years. So again, another opportunity to learn from an older guy. And so those are kind of players, of course, Reggie White, Seth Joyner, just great uh, mentors, uh, outstanding men. And Reggie was really the, um, the, the pie, the cream, the filling, he was everything. And he held great uh, player and, and uh, meetings at his house, uh, camaraderie nights, him and Sarah just doing a great job. And that's kind of environment I was raised in. So from that point on, wherever I went, New Orleans, Oakland, later on, I was always trying to bring that element to the locker room. And hopefully I was able to um, show a path to guys like Charles Woodson and, and, uh, and Tim and some of the other guys. So that's that's kind of, you know, what that's always football. That's why football is important. That's what it's been about for me. That's that's amazing. Amazing story, obviously, you know, you know, long. Well, hopefully, hopefully uh, Pro Player Foundation, hopefully we have a big celebration uh, this upcoming Super Bowl that uh, one of their members uh, back into the Hall of Fame. But ProPlayerFoundation.org, you can go to. We do uh, so many charitable events in NFL cities. Uh, Taste, which you bring those great restaurants from your cities into one location, allow folks to come through. You can get autographed jerseys, autographed helmets. Uh, we have an awesome, uh, it's called Reach. You want to reach the community, and we do it with MS. So we bring those great doctors in your community. We bring MS patients, and we have a Q&A with families. In some NFL cities, we're trying to broaden that. So this will be year 20 this year. We'll be at the Super Bowl this year doing taste of whatever Super Bowl site we're at. Again, those restaurants from that city will be there. You'll get an opportunity to engage and help and look at uh, be around those NFL players and talk about their communities. So ProPlayerFoundation.org, go to. And if we're in your NFL city, be sure to, uh, to reach out and try and be a part of it. Awesome. Thank you again. There he is, the great Eric Allen, 1999.
Oakland Raiders Courage Award recipient, yeah. Philadelphia Eagles, great. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you out in the Super Bowl because we're planning on headed out there as well, do some interviews. Yes. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to catch up. Uh, looking forward uh, to, to hearing your name announced uh, coming and hopefully in the next couple of weeks as, as uh, the latest uh, of, of Hall of Famers um, in, in the NFL. So we, again, appreciate everything. And uh, thank you again, Eric. Uh, it was a great, great, great time talking with you. Yeah, it was awesome. Really appreciate you and Tricia Ed Block Courage Award all those years ago, uh, being able to help me out. And uh, it was great talking to you today, my man. Thanks.